Fantastic. Here we are. We're only on the penultimate week of uh, Romans Fest. And uh, yeah, um, what, I've got, what we've been preparing is a handout that everyone will get next week. And it's got on one side, it'll have this like summary of the Romans, like what it is. And then on the other side, what we're going to do is try to say, and in the, in the second half next week, when we're right at the end of the whole thing, we're going to be trying to think, so we've done Romans. What are we going to do with it? What does it mean for us? And we're going to generally, we're going to have some things on the other side that will be, uh, and we'll actually take some time in that second half next week to go, right, so if this is true, what am I going to do? And in the street that I'm on, that, do I believe the gospel? And if so, that I'm on that street and those people need to know. And how am I going to do that? We're going to think about that. Um, so that's a heads up. And so even people who maybe haven't come for a week or two or, how, you know, for the you might say to them, oh, you can try and come for this last one because that is when we're really going to think what are we going to do with this if it's true. And so tonight we'll, we'll be prepping ourselves a little bit for that as we're thinking about Romans 16. Because remember, at Romans 15 that Jonathan did, um, it's Paul is coming through. He's like, I'm going to pop into Jerusalem, drop off some cash there, and then... I'm coming through because I'm on the way to do Mission Spain. And I want you guys on board with this. Like, by the time I come to you, I want you to have read this letter, understood it, and just be so fired up for mission, for taking the gospel out there. And you might be thinking, oh, but the Spaniards, eh? Like, what are they like? And you'll be, and then in, You'll be like, no, it's all right. He's thinking, it doesn't matter. You won't be thinking, well, think of cultural differences or whatever it is. Um, you'll be like, it doesn't matter. The gospel is so powerful. We're ready to go with Paul. We're going to send a team and we're going to do churches in Spain and anywhere. That's what he's hoping. That's what he's hoping. Um, now, what we'll think what what he actually did well you know what did he do mission spain and all that it doesn't really matter that roman church they did <laughs> go they did they were just crazy big on mission in those early centuries they were constantly sending people out anywhere and everywhere um because they believed this they did believe it and did it and there's loads of great stories, isn't there? Like um, Augustine of Canterbury, when it, uh, they sent him, you've got to go and convert the Brits, all those people in east of England. They're very difficult, you know. And he's like, oh, and he's like, no, I'm not going to them. We'll never convert all those people in Essex. Um, and he turned around and come back, didn't he? He's like, no, I'm not doing it. And he went back to Rome. He's like, I can't face Essex. Um, <laughs> And, he, and, he, and then the, you know, the Roman church said, nah, mate, you get back. Because this gospel, we believe it. You go. You go and do that. And so he did. <laughs> and then there's all stories about that. And he arrives and, you know, he gets on with it in the, in the east of England, doesn't he? Um, and they did that all the time. And one of the things, like, people forget, like, all the way through history, that this church at Rome, and some, you know, we, we might say, oh, well, there's a bit, there's, they've had some problems and things. Yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not overlooking that. But that global mission imperative, they've really had it. And that's really because of this letter, isn't it? They've had that um, because of this letter. And so it was, it worked in that way. And we want to get that. So when Paul's like, I'm coming on my way to Spain, I want you super fired up 
and that you won't, I don't want anyone saying, oh, but how are you supposed to reach Spanish people? He's like, no, you won't be thinking that if you've understood this letter. You'll know how to do it, the gospel. So we uh, want to be like that. And all our hesitations and fears, and we, have a, we want to be able to, no, nah, if this is real, this is true, we can do this. We can do this. And that's what we'll think a little bit this evening. In the first part, I'm going to just, like, refresh us about this gospel that leads to Romans 16. Because for me, in some ways, Romans 16 is, uh, you know, maybe it's the most important chapter in the whole book. Because it's, Jonathan said, it's like, like if you're in a chemistry lesson and you've had all this theory and now the teacher's getting out test tubes and Bunsen burners and things and he's going to go, see, see what I just told you, look, it, it works, right? That is what Romans 16 is, where he's like, he's gone on about all this saying, look, this works, this does for anybody Everybody, wherever they are, whatever their background, Jesus can rescue them. And now, when he's, because chapter 16 is of Romans, it's just this massive long list of people. Why? It's because what, what we'll see this week and next week is we'll be like, ah, oh, he's gone. See, what I just told you is true. Look at this that's already going on. At Rome, he's demonstrating it. Uh, he's going because remember he's wanting them to have this confidence that the Lord God there's this one like olive tree, and everybody in the world can be part of this big tree of life. Or well, Jesus says like I am this true vine, and every you know people can be part of me and and have fruit and all of that. And that's so Jesus uses the vine. He's talked about it as an olive tree, and we thought about why he does that. But all this olive tree, and whether, you know, natural branches, wild branches, all that, he said, it doesn't matter. Everyone can be part of this olive tree, global. And now he's going to show that in Romans 16. So we'll, but first of all, I'm going to, well, well let, I'll tell you what, let's just read a little bit of it. Um, Romans 16 from verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon, of the church in Cancrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at the house. I greet my friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, possibly family members, anyway, Pete will tell us about that, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. That verse had a huge impact on me on that idea that being in, they were in Christ before I was. Because it means like a person isn't in Christ until they trust him. And that, that idea, you trust him, then you're in Christ. Then all that, you know, righteousness and holiness and being chosen by God and everything, all of that is in him. And you're not in him until, you know, where you don't come into the world and say, oh, maybe I'm already in Christ. No, nah, you're not. By faith, you're joined to Christ kind of thing. It's, it, it's important, that. But uh, I won't talk about that now. I might, we'll save that. 
Okay, well, I won't do any more because, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. We're going to hear about them. You'll see in verse 10, greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. What a character he is. Well, you'll see. You'll see. But before I, get, before I have PJ talk about some of these, I just wanted to talk, just like focusing us on the, this gospel because we're going to see these people here come from all over the world, actually. Um, the, in, the people here, you know, he's got Persians, Thracians, Jews, Greeks, Romans, men and women, Europe, Africa, Asia. That's what we're going to see. And the fact that he names them all, because you might go, you might, I know sometimes you might go, I can't be bothered reading Romans 16. It's just all the names, isn't it? Like, and people say that about genealogy in the Old Testament. They go, I can't be, I'm not reading all that. It's just all these names. Yeah, but if your name was on it, you'd be like, oh, it's the best chapter in the Bible, that one. <laughs> Think of that. If it was you, it would be your favorite chapter of the Bible. Think of, that's what you got to do when you read these. Real, these were people, real people. And the Holy Spirit and Paul, you know, is wanting to honor them and say, and all, you know, when you get lists of people who built the temple or rebuilt the temple, and there's all these lists of them in the Old Testament, it's like, oh, for me, I don't know, why do I care whether this guy built some little section or you, if it was you, you'd care. And the point is, the living God does care about individual people. And it, he pays attention to what people do, and he bothers about it. And he writes it down, and he's like, ah, oh, there's someone who's part of that church, and they're serving, and they're building up, and they're bearing fruit. I'm going to make a note of that. They're going in my book. And I, want, I, I don't want that to be forgotten. That person, that individual person, I know their name and what they've done. And I care about that. I value that. The Bible's full of names because God's like that, the living God. He cares about individuals and he honors individuals. And that's true. He's like that now. And, you know, if you're serving in church and building church and all this, He's seeing that. He's like, oh, get, I, want, I don't want that to be forgotten. I'm writing it down. And he reads that stuff. And he's like, oh, I love reading about what they've done, who they are. They're precious to me. So that's why a chapter like that, read it and always think, if I was in it, how good of chapter would I think it is? Read it as if that's like it is and be like that with them. Honor these people. Uh, because that's, the Lord's telling us something about how much people matter. People matter. And that, you know, history, we might go, oh, well, it's all history and it? it's all forgotten. It isn't forgotten to him. And, the, you know, on that last day when these books are opened, as it says, what's he written in all these books that are going to be opened that he talks about in Daniel? This stuff. <laughs> He's writing about you. Your biographies in his books. If you belong to him, he writes your biography, sort of, and he notes it. You'll, there's lots about that in the Bible, writing it all down. Uh, and just notice then, let, I'll, I'll only say this, because Pete is going to say more, but just that Europe, Asia, Africa, there's like uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa, those are princesses, aren't they? I won't say any more than that. That's, I won't, I don't, they come from a very interesting part of the world, so you'll see that. They're European people. Priscilla and Aquila are Italian Jews. We'll hear about them. Asia, there's someone just called Persis, who's Persian. Uh, Herodian person. I won't say, any, I won't say too much, because Pige is going to give us the old birth. They're from Asia, Africa. Aristobulus, is he African? Yeah, okay. Is, and Rufus? Yeah, there we go. So all these continents are represented in this chapter. So he's already a multinational global gathering of people that he's like deliberately recalling all that. Um, and that's why this is important. And, and then what we're going to do is we'll find out about these people. Some of it, we can, the Bible tells us more about these people. And sometimes these people we, were famous in the first century. 
and they went all over and we know about them. Some, some we hardly know anything about at all. We just, I don't know. Paul's like, oh, you know that person. And we're like, no, nah. <laughs> we, we don't know very much. But some of them, books and things were written about them, these people. And PJ is going to help us. PJ, Paul Joshua, that's what PJ stands for. Um, he'll, he'll, uh, he does mad research on all this stuff. Um, well, I'll interview him in a minute to help you understand about that. But let's focus on the gospel then. I want to just say, right at the beginning, Paul told us that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everybody who believes in Jesus. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everybody who believes, who trusts Jesus. And I want us to just consider that for a, a little, just first, because that is what we must have grasped from the book of Romans. He told us that at the beginning, and he believes he's delivered on that, that we should now be like, yes, I know what the gospel is, and I see how it's the power of God for everybody and, and I understand what salvation is. And I understand how important trust, faith is and Jesus and all this. Let, I'm just going to run through those things quickly because it's so important to this appreciation. How is it that so many different people from so many different cultures, backgrounds, places, everything, how are all of them working together this way? How? Because to, to unite people together is almost the impossible dream. I know in modern world, it's like everyone's fragmenting, falling apart from each other. What can fix that? Well, we, he's like, look at this. Look at this. So we need, the, and it's the gospel. So the, the gospel, let's just start on that, what the gospel. Peter's just telling me, like the ancient Anglo-Saxons, it's... Uh, what is it? The, the good spell. It's like a spell, the gospel. You know, and you, because you, if you've ever seen the Harry Potter or something, they'll say some words and incredible things happen. And then it put, it's like they said, that's what the gospel's like. You say these words, incredible things happen. People are transformed. It's a God spell. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, and I'm like, whoa. So when you say the gospel, just to say these words, amazing things happen. People are transformed. Society's changed by this message. And I find that a powerful way of thinking. The goal then is, you know, to save everybody, rescue everybody. Say, it, the way that's done is the gospel. And it, it's just this crazy revolutionary idea. You know, everyone, you know, People kind of want to change the world. They want to fix the world. They have all sorts of ideas how to do that. Let's make the world better. Let's fix it. The number one problem with the world is, and then whatever they think it is. Um, and then sometimes they think politicians can deliver on it. And they'll say, oh, if only we had, you know, better health care or better education or lower taxes, higher taxes, more military, less military, but whatever it is. But that isn't how the, you really change. According to this, the world is truly changed rather than just superficially, but really changed is through the gospel. And it's a message. It's a message from the living God. That is just crazy. Just some words that you can share with somebody. That is how you change. That's how they are changed. That's how the world is changed. Through some words that God's authorized us to say. I, I constantly find, I'm like, what? No, but that, you, just, uh, that's why you think of it like why they probably said it's like a spell. Because <laughs> words just can't change the world, can they? These words can that's what Paul really believes. Everyone in the Bible really believes that if you tell someone this, 
nothing, that can utterly change them, and nothing else can. Not like that. It's a message. And that's why we want to just pause on this as we're coming to the end of Romans, that we want to be absolutely convinced that there's the most important thing we can ever do in our lives is tell people the gospel. We can do lots of other great things and whatever, but nothing is as important as that saying this message to people. Uh, and, you, you know, we want to live in a way that's, uh, that, as the, as the scriptures say, makes the gospel attractive and is consistent with it and all that. But no matter how we live, no one's going to be converted until we tell them this message. Just remember that. You cannot ever live in such a way that's so extraordinary that in and of itself that will convert people. It won't. I always remember there was a, I had this colleague back at All Souls years ago, and he said there was a guy who, who was amazing in the way he lived and everything, and he'd lived like that in his office for like something like 10 years, but never said that he was a Christian, never shared the gospel. But he was in his mind, I'm making a big impact because I'm living in such a different way. And then one day, even this is what changed him, he said. One day, someone came up to me and said, there's something different about you, isn't there? And he was like, this is it. This is what I've lived for for eight years. And they said, are you a vegetarian? <laughs> and it's just funny because they're like, why not? Why not? Vegetarian people might, or vegans or something, can live really differently really differently and so that in and of itself to live in a really different way in and of itself won't change the world what will is if you speak this message with that it's the speaking that message that suddenly makes sense of that why you live that way oh right that's why that is the explanation this message is what changes. So that's the thing. And I agree. I, I constantly am like shocked by it. <laughs> that it's um, just, it's words. It's a message. It's truth. That, that, that God has authorized us to say. It's this, this is what it is. Just this last week, we were listening. Jonathan and I were checking out someone who was telling, said, this is what the gospel is. This is the good news. That we can all do a little bit to make the world a better place. And God can join all that up together to make a big change. That's the gospel. And we were like, no, it isn't. <laughs> that isn't the gospel. That's, I guess, a message that, you know, anyone, loads of people have that sort of a message in one form or another. And it's like an optimistic message and things like that. But it isn't the gospel. That isn't the gospel. That's us changing the world. The gospel is, the good news is, God has done something. God's done something to change you. See, we kind of know deep down we can't fix ourselves. And if we don't, we ought to know that. We can't fix ourselves. The good news is, I know, God's like, I know, I know. I can fix you. I've done what's necessary to fix you. That's good news. That's good news. But any message that is uh, here's the good news. Here's what you need to do to fix yourself. That's bad news. That's bad news, actually. And no matter how it's packaged, it is always going to lead to heaviness, burden. Even because on your good day, you may be up for it. And when you're fired up, you're like, yeah, that's right. I'm going to be so good now. But you're not, you're not every day. And for me, sometimes you can get fired up and you might, oh, I'm, oh. <laughs> and then, but that isn't going to fix it. The great news is, at my worst, helpless, God rescues. God, God's, God saves. God saves. That's the good news. The living God, as we've looked, gone through Romans, we're in a big, what have we learned? We're in a bigger mess than we ever feared. Far, you know, where those early chapters where he's digging down into the depth of the mess, it was worse than we feared. But he actually said, but here's some good news. God's angry about it. And we're like, what? 
And he goes, no, because that means he still cares. He cares and he's getting involved and he's saying, look at this mess. He cares and he sent his son to become one of us and to take, face up to that mess and take it on. And in his death, specifically his death, there's so much about that here, dealing with that sinful mess and then rising from the dead on the third day to have this new kind of human life, a totally different kind of human life that's right with God, a kind of human life in which God can live the Spirit of God, not just for a bit, but forever. And we were thinking that this message of this can fix everybody in the world. We were just thinking, like, what excites people in heaven? Like, in heaven right now, there's, you know, hundred, hundreds of millions of angels. And there's all the saints, the church triumphant, and there's the, how many archangels are there? The seven? Yeah, the seven. He, he's an expert on angels as well as other things. But uh, angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, that's what we say, isn't it? Hundreds of millions of angels and all the saints of all the ages, and there's the 24 elders around the throne, isn't there? You know, all that stuff. And you're like, oh, what's that like, that level of reality? And we think, you know, the first heaven where birds fly, the atmosphere, the second heaven, all the galaxies. Then there's this really serious level of reality, the third heaven, what is, the, what is it that excites them? What are they, what's the center of their attention? What do they go, ah, this, this is so awesome that even at that level of reality, they're like, oh, this is it. Well, let's see. In Revelation 5, we get an insight. Revelation 4 and 5, remember, John is there and he gets this ability to look into what's going on in the highest level of reality. And chapter 4, there's the throne room scene and the Father and then the Spirit there. And then in chapter 5, the Lamb, the Lamb who is able to unlock the secrets of the universe and everyone in heaven is so thankful for him. And verse 9, they sang this new song saying, you, God the Son, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, because you died, and with your blood you purchased for God people from, and this is so critical to Romans, isn't it, the vision of everybody, people from every tribe and every language, every people, culture, nation, everybody and you've united them together to be a kingdom see all the nations of the world you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth Whoa. and then there's another little version of it when the um, the many angels verse 11 numbering Thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000, 100 million. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and they said, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Notice that. Right. So that's the good news. That work of God has rescued us. And that's the message, right? And it's the, so that's the first point, the gospel. Is the power of God the power of God. Let's just, so it's a message that is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. And if we really believe that, how powerful is God? Quite powerful, right? Let's assume God's quite powerful. Because like the entire universe, God made that. So more powerful than the universe. But the gospel is, is the power of God. Like, this is the maximum demonstration of God's power. Nothing else is the power of God, but this is the power of God. Like this is where his power is fully exercised. Because we might think, oh no, but God, the power of God's shown in like big physical miracles or something like that, where, I don't know, he changes the weather or fixes human bodies and makes them heals or things like that. 
no, that's not the power of God in the Bible. It's powerful and we love it. He yeah, does do those things. We believe in it. We love it if he does those things. We appreciate it. Uh, but it's not, those things are not the power of God. Because you know, to, to bring about physical change, we've thought about this before, it's not that hard for God. Even fixing a human body, physically healing a body, even humans, we can kind of do that sort of thing. You know, medicine, things like that. I suppose that's also from God too. But, um, but rescuing a person, saving a person, we, we can't do that. We can't ever do that. And it's we. Re- even God can hardly do it. <laughs> Seriously, even God can hardly do it. It's really hard for God to do it. We can't say, oh, it's effortless to God to save people. No, no, look, we've just seen it killed him to do it. It killed him to do it. That's how hard it was for him to go, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you. For him to say that, he's had to go to himself. I will, I'm going to have to die. There's, I, I can't, like, there's no limit. I, this is going to cost me everything I've got to rescue people. It's going to cost me everything to rescue her or him. And it's, uh, that's what it's going to do. So it's all, like as Paul says one time, he's like, all the almighty dynamite power of God that is demonstrated or channeled into renewing somebody, okay? So to give a person new birth into a new kind of humanity, that, behind that, is the maximum power of God. So always think about that. Whenever you see that happen and the gospel brings about that transformation in a person's life, you will never see God do anything more powerful than that. You know, God's, that's why when he does it, it says there is rejoicing in, the, in heaven over it. Like, and it's before the angels in heaven, there's, there's rejoicing about that. Singing and joy. It, and that isn't necessarily the angels that are doing it, because it's in front of the angels. So it's presumably God, like, what? Like, he's so excited when, when salvation is achieved. If somebody is saved because even God's like, oh man, we've done it. We've accomplished something really difficult. So God rejoices and the angels watch God like, like I don't know, running down the touchline and sliding on his knees or something. Is that what, I think that's the appropriate behavior um, or whatever is the equivalent. <laughs> so the hardest thing in all of the universe is rescuing human beings fr- from because it's what we're going to think about what it is that salvation is, but it's because it's rescuing people from sin and hell to righteousness and heavenly reality and all of that. And, and to accomplish it, remember, the world, the flesh, and the devil are all utterly opposed to salvation. Everything in this world is against it. Don't you ever feel that? If you, when you're good, so if you're going to say this God spell... If you're going to pronounce the gospel, you are, you are definitely going to get aggro from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Definitely. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil know this is serious. This is the power of God. This is the one thing that can change the world, the flesh, and the devil and defeat them. Nothing else does. Everything, everyone, every other way of trying to change the world, the flesh, and the devil will never really change it. It'll just like superficially change it, but it won't ever change it or defeat them. The gospel will, because it's the power of God. So you will have opposition. And in the gods, all the gods of this passing age, all the gods, and the Bible names all these sorts of gods. And what the Lord says to them in Isaiah and Jeremiah and things like that, he'll say, you gods, why don't you save somebody? And he challenges people, you calling on these gods, are they going to save you? 
That's the challenge to any God. And I've now, you know, sometimes followers of, a, of major religion and things, I'm saying, can your God save? Because none of them can. None of them can save. What they can do is say, uh, here's how we think you can save yourself. Here's some instructions. Well, that's rubbish. Any idiot can do that. Oh, no, but these are really good instructions. Don't matter. Any idiot can give them. Can your God save? That's the question. The mark of divinity is that. Can you save? That's the only thing I want to know. Any God who's going to be at the table of being truly divine, they've got to, they've got to be able to save. That's what the Lord says in the Bible. Because the gospel is the power of God. And when we share the gospel, we need to know that, that the power of God to the maximum is behind us when we speak it, the God spell. When we talk to someone, because we might be in ourselves thinking, oh man, this, this is never... I don't even know what, whether I'm going to say it properly. I'm not a good speaker. I stammer. I, what, are they gonna, what am I going to say if they ask me a difficult question? And, the, and all of that, we might not say it the right way. We might answer questions in a confused and mother. Yeah, all true and likely. All of that, yes, of course. And we might, it doesn't matter. It isn't your power behind the gospel. It isn't your power it is God's power. This is the, the power of God. So when you utter the spell, the God spell, and say, this is the gospel, it is, this is, it's not your, of course your power is pathetic, your power of speech. And actually, the bigger danger, and then Paul makes this point, the bigger danger is that you think you are a good speaker. Isn't it? Paul is worried that he might come across as a good communicator. And he's like, that would be terrible. Because then people might think, oh, the gospel's powerful because he's a good communicator. And he's like, no! Oh, that's terrible! I'm going to have to deliberately speak badly now. <laughs> like, but it, that would be horrific, wouldn't it? If a person was like, oh, he's such a good communicator. That's why the gospel... No! In some ways, that's why through church history, some of the greatest gospel preachers are terrible communicators because the Lord's like, yeah, exactly. That's how I'm doing it. And then what are you going to say? <laughs> See, and that's powerful. So you might say, I'm a rubbish... Moses, remember at the beginning, he's like, I'm a rubbish communicator. I can't, I've just been speaking to sheep for 40 years. I can't speak to people. And the Lord's like, yeah, yeah, you can. And you're gonna, you're gonna. Now, you might say, you might say, no, but I'm really rubbish, and I'm so shy, and, and I was like, yeah, brilliant, you, brilliant, that's optimal, that's optimal, because when you say it, you know it isn't going to depend on you, perfect, see, the power of the gospel is God, not you and me, not you and me, so we, we need to have this crazy confidence that when we share this message, there's a power behind us, the greatest power in the universe. And our only obsession needs to be that we say it correctly, like meaning we say the actual gospel. That's the only thing that matters, that he's like, I'm giving you this gospel. This is what it is. Say it, say that. That's the only thing we need to worry about. Not whether we're a good speaker, not whether we can answer all the questions. I can't answer all the questions. I've been at this sort of thing for quite a while and Speaker's Corner and things like that. Often people ask me questions. I'm like, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Like, can I get back to you on it? And it's like, whatever, just say that. I don't know. Um, I'll have to have a think or I'll have to ask someone, whatever. It's not that. The only thing that really matters is that we say the actual gospel. Because if you do that, God's behind that. So one of the things I've said in this, this is why I mentioned the handout, a piece of homework for next week that I would like you to work on. What is the gospel? 
What is the gospel? From Romans, say. Do it from Romans, because that's what we've been doing. <laughs> but just trying to summarize it, say, in three points. Could you say, here's three key sort of sentences or something. There's this, there's this, and there's this. You know, or you don't have to, but you could say, no, I actually need five little things. All right, that's all right. But you know what I'm saying? Something super simple that goes, this is the gospel. This is what a person, I would need. this is the message that we must say. You might just pick some verses and go, I want to say that verse, then this verse, and I want to say this verse or whatever. But see if you can do that for next week. And then we'll, as we're like, because what you want to be in a position to do, isn't it? Is go, this is the gospel. I'm now going to tell it to people. That's what we want to be doing in two weeks. <laughs> so that's a little piece of homework. All right, now, um, I'll just do a little bit more. So salvation, just more quickly now. So it's the gospel message, is a message. It's the power of God, not our power. It's salvation. And, and just on that, what is salvation? The purpose of the good news, this, this God spell, is to save us from hell. It's to save us from being cut off from the life of God being enemies of God, being rejected from heaven, right? That's what salvation is. God is angry with sin and cannot have us around forever. That is more serious than we can ever dream. That's what we need to be rescued from. We need to become friends of God that's, what's, that's what the, the good news is. You can be a friend of God. You can be part of his family. He'll love you. He'll bring you into his family instead of pushing you away and keeping you away forever. He'll keep you to himself forever. That's the good news. That's the purpose. That's what salvation is. Now, that's so important because politicians, thinkers, all of us, we might think, no, uh, what a person need, to save a person, we need to save them in terms of health and wealth. They need to be saved from illness or poverty, say. Or they need better education, better employment, comfort, money, but all, all sorts, whatever it is. Like, what, all these things. And we'll say, those are all perfectly good things in this world terms, but they're not salvation. They're not salvation. That when the living God, we look at the world and go, the biggest problems in the world today are, we might go, uh, you know, poverty or inequalities. or and, and, and the, Yeah, those are all problems with will, but they're not the problem. The deep problem is this. Is this issue of sin. The reason, in a way, for all these other ones is that people on, are enemies of God. Those are symptoms of the, the real disease. All these things are symptoms of the actual disease. The actual disease is this problem of sin and being an enemy of God and cut off from the life of God and, and rejected from God. That's the disease, right? That is what the gospel addresses. And then, actually, some of these other things... You know, church is a place where it's, you, you, these other things, you start to go, oh, wow, we're starting to share things together, look after one another, be united to another. All that sort of thing starts to happen. As that's what church is about. But you, you, the, the salvation is not directly those things. The salvation is aimed at become, being reconciled to God, being joined to God. That's what salvation is. Because nothing else matters until that happens. Right? That's hugely important to believe that. To believe that. So why that matters is Jesus healed 10 lepers. So you might say, oh, he saved them. They were ill, mortally ill, really. He's fixed them. Nah. Only one of them wanted anything to do with Jesus. Remember? So the, the, the other ten weren't saved. 
one of them was saved. Because one of them actually connected to Jesus and trusted him and loved him. The others were not saved. He healed them. They weren't saved. Same with food, the food. You remember, he's like giving out all this food and they're like, ah, lovely, brilliant. Can you just keep doing that? We love that. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, I am the bread. I'm the bread, not that. I can, I can make it so you're not physically hungry, but that's nothing. I'm the bread that you need to eat, right? I am it. Do you, conf- do, are you believing in me? Are you feeding on me? Only a few were. Only a few were saved. Many benefited from him physically. Only a few were actually saved. That's a massive thing. As Jesus says, many are called, and lots of people, only a few actually enter in. And because what salvation is, is being reconciled to God, becoming a friend of God through Jesus. So we have to be rescued. See, salvation is this revolutionary transformation that can happen when we're in prison. When we're dying in hospital, when we're in poverty, when we're in desperate situations, and we can be saved, even though none of those things change, we can still be saved. And knowing actually a kind of weird joy even in these situations because we're saved. Right. The fourth thing I know quickly is everybody, and I've already labored that. So the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everybody who believes. And so that everybody point, he's, he, what he's taught us in Romans is everybody is rejected the same. And that's good news because he's saying, I'm not saying some people are rejected because they are not got the right genealogy. They're not from the right nation. That's why I'm rejecting them. He's like, no, no, forget all that. I'll just re- I'm rejecting everybody. I'm rejecting everybody. It doesn't matter what they're religious, but I don't, know, I don't care how zealous they are. I don't care what their intentions are. I don't care whether they're like, you know, interested in God or atheists. Look, all of you are rejected. None of you are right with me. And the good thing about that is everybody's equally rejected and therefore the same solution applies to everybody the same. He's like, and therefore, I'll I'll write you all off the same and not pay any attention to the stuff you think make a difference that don't. All these things that you are, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm. And there's like, not interested. None of that makes any difference at all. What I'm, there's just one thing that works for everybody and it's just this trust me just trust me and it and that is equally accessible to everybody you might say oh i'm you know i'm totally thick that's all right like he literally goes little tiny kids get this you have to in fact you have to be like a tiny little toddler to actually be saved (laughs) So you have to be thick, so, you know, or not, you don't, oh, um, you know, I have no education, doesn't matter, neither is a little tiny toddler, I haven't got resources, neither of they, zealous for God, neither are they, <laughs> you know, he's like, I don't, I'm not interested in any of that, all I am is, will you just trust me, that I can fix you, that's all I'm saying, just do that, so the good news is, he's like, I'm not interested in anything, except this, will you trust me, that I can fix you, yes. I'll fix you. See, that's the good news, isn't it? That's lovely. That's so lovely. It's all he's asking. Trust me. If you trust anything else, I can't help you because nothing else will fix you. But I'm just asking that you trust me because the whole point of salvation is that you and me are together. So the, the only thing I require is that you start with minimally saying I think you can rescue me because the whole and then after leave it with me I'll do everything I've already done it I'll do it but the whole point of this is for us to be friends so the minimum thing I ask is you just say I trust you to rescue me fix me will you do that
That's all I, that, and then that works for everybody, doesn't it? That's what's beautiful about it, for everybody. There's nobody who can't go, help, help. Everyone knows how to do that. So that's what that is. And finally, I just wanted to say the gospel is centered on Jesus, though. Uh, it is trusting Jesus because um, the, the, it's so, um, the word God really is not going to get us to the real gospel in the end. Because the many gods people believe in, whether are formal human religions or gods of their own personal invention, none of these gods are the living God who saves. Remember, only one, only this living God saves. So we must, it's important, that's why I think it's so important to keep that name of Jesus. As Peter says, there is only one name given to human beings so that they can be rescued and fixed. Jesus. And once you say that name, Jesus, it's culturally disruptive, isn't it? It causes trouble. And people are like, ah. Oh. Like, if you just say God, that's all right. It doesn't mean anything. Jesus means something. It means something. It's disruptive. So I just think it's important to keep that in mind because, in my experience, talking about God without talking about Jesus quickly becomes bad news because it quickly ends up being about what we need to do. Just invariably. Once people talk about God without talking about Jesus, very quickly it's always going to be, so this is what you need to do. This is the burden on you. But as long as you've always started talking about Jesus, you can't really do, get to that. It's, it's going to be good news if you're focused on the real God who is, you know, Jesus. That's it. Now, I know we're going to have a cheeky coffee in a minute, but um, before we do, let's pull PJ up first. And I'm going to, he, he's involved in something called the Global Church History Project. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about that? What's, what is the Global Church History Project? Uh, so it's a, like an online kind of project that, you know, we are just making loads of different resources. So we've got quite a few different things out. Uh, Last year, we focused on getting a little hagiography, like a little... Uh, What's a hagiography, Peach? <laughs> it's, what a, is that? it's a biography of a saint. So in Greek, a saint is called a hagios. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, a, a graphos, a writing, uh, a biography of a saint. So a stories of saints. Yeah, yeah. Right. and they're Stories like, of uh, Christians yeah. from... From, well, yeah, from the first century, from all around the world. And then, so, and, not and only from the first yeah, century, that's you, true. yeah, from yeah. all around the world throughout yeah. church history. Because the point is, quite often people know a little bit about European church history, mm. and particularly post Reformation, they might know a, a little bit. But you were like saying, no, nah, but there's like church history been going on all mm. over the world, all through history. I'm going to, like, be... So the project is, is helping to fill that gap and go, there's just as much history happened all over the world, all through the centuries. So for one year, you, you, there's a whole year's worth, so each day mm. there's an interesting one. Yeah, who's, yeah. who's today's one? I don't remember. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I was who was, stuff. Who's, who's the one from this week that you can remember? Uh, didn't we have Paphnutius of Thebes? And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's I think right. We did. Uh, yeah, half the of thieves. One yeah. of the desert fathers. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. we did have that one. That's true. I did yeah. remember that. So uh, each day on Facebook, <laughs> mm. Global Church History, do a little mm. uh, story of, yeah. a, of one of these saints from somewhere in the world mm. through church history. And so the, we did that for a year. But then the longer yes. ones online on the Patreon. So behind that kind of paywall, <laughs> yeah. there is the longer one so like twice as long or more because sometimes yeah. there's a lot of footnotes if you want to know all the sources it's, it's all there um but then this last year we've been focusing more on uh, church seasons is what we we're thinking because for the it, throughout the old testament the lord promises there will be seasons as a kind of blessing and there will be these times and they will remind us of wonderful truths about jesus about the church and how do we connect that in? Because, like, there was a time where Christians tried to purge all times and seasons and everything from their thinking. Um, and that's not really biblical. 
because, God, yeah, God made these things to be used. And when we purge these things of meaning, we do still make new meaning, but it will be less rooted. So is it like the church year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're writing that stuff. And uh, we've written a lot on Michaelmas, because that was a really What is Michaelmas? Time. Come on, Pete. Not everyone <laughs> knows what that is. Yeah. So that's it, in late September, but it's a whole season, but like it starts in late September. It's the like kind of modern equivalent of the festival of trumpets from the old testament where people would go around and they'd blow trumpets and it was a it was the final harvest festival and jesus thinks about it a lot because he thinks about this final harvest because you get like first harvest where you get the first fruits no don't go too much detail because we want you on the actual room 16 stuff so uh, that, and, and it was lots about angels as well, yeah. wasn't it? So yeah. he, he, that's when he wrote, like, effectively several books, really, mm. on angels. So you could ask him about angels if you want to know about angels. So uh, the Global Church History Project, and so in Romans 16, to keep you focused on this, <laughs> he has too much to say. Imagine, be, imagine being like that. Um, <laughs> so you've gone through these people, mm. and you'll help us a bit this week and some next week going through these people and there's some of them there's lots about them isn't there and yeah, they've yeah. done lots who are you going to start us off with uh oh there's probably too much on mary mark's mother so uh, i'll skip over her but we'll we'll start her off like in the in the second half should we? yeah yeah uh, You've, can you give us one in five minutes uh, should we look at Herodian? Do maybe? it. Uh, Where's okay. Herodian then? Let me. Find. That's Herodian. in verse eleven. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew, or my relative. So traditionally, right. that was pronounced. Do, um, do that one. And uh, I'm staying here because yeah. the, <laughs> we're waiting to have a cheeky coffee, and you can wait four or five minutes. Go okay. Uh, so Herodian, uh, he's one of tra traditionally said to be one of the seventy-two apostles. So in Luke 10, Jesus didn't just send out these 12 apostles. He sent 72, a much larger group of apostles. Uh, and they say Herodian was one of that group. Um, and he was related to the Herod family, hence his name. But he was adopted by Paul's family. So if you were adopted in Roman society, you'd have your original name as one of your names, but you'd add like Ian to it. So he's Herodian because he, he, but then he's, Ian. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, but he's adopted by a different family, and that was Paul's family, informs us. So Paul considers him a relative, which is very interesting. And so he's another one of Paul's relatives that beat him to the apostolic call. And this one particular book with a great name, The Monology of St. Basil the Bulgar Slayer. Um, if there's any Bulgarians tuning in, they'll say, that's the terrible name. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> the Bulgar Slayer. Uh, yeah, but um, <laughs> it's a very interesting He was a book. historian, was he? He was an emperor who... Oh commissioned a team of historians to try and make a definitive church history uh, did, did a bit of what we, we did in the global church history project where every single day they tell you about who saint's feast it is and what what that saint did and for herodians day they talk quite a bit about herodian and they this monology so this team of historians they noted that herodian was known for being incredibly humble and so there was a lot of the 72 apostles who were able to command, like, a lot of respect. James, Joses, the brothers of God, and Philemon, they were known to be able to, like, do this. In the, uh, Paul's epistle to the Galatians, Paul says that when James, he didn't even turn up, he just sent people to, like, give his kind of message. And then everyone just, like, caved in and was like, oh, it, it must be right. Even Barnabas, who had been fighting for Paul so much, he folded, and that, that's the kind of effect some of these 72 apostles can have, because they were taught by Jesus for three years. They've got yeah. a lot of authority, a lot of clout. Uh, but Herodian instead, he was, fam he was kind of known, if he ever was known, for being not known. Uh, he was very unassuming, and he was always looking. He was actively searching out the most kind of menial, servant-hearted roles to fulfill, he always willingly put himself under the authority of his fellow apostles. He never, like, pulled rank with them. Um, he did whatever they asked of him, and he never used his royal heritage because he's related oh, to yeah. the king, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah but he, he never reminded anyone of that fact. Uh, but he does seem to be happy for Paul to remind everyone that he's, him and Paul are related. Uh, so that was him. He's, uh, a lot of his characters remembered, and they also remember either that he was crucified with Peter and Paul 
But there might have been another guy just called Rodian that he got confused with, who, who dined with Queen Paul. Most say Her- Herodian went on to Petrus with the apostle Andrew, and he was martyred there, possibly crucified. So but he, he did end up crucified either in mm. Rome or Petrus. Yeah. All right, we'll right. stop you. We'll stop okay. you. That's like Her- that's Herodian, and when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, he must be connected to Herod, but it turns out he's a relative Paul. There we go. Uh, very humble person. That's our, one of our first ones. So that's a person who's really from an Asian background, like yeah, back in an there. an Edomite. Yeah. An Edomite, okay. Yeah. Right, that's a little sample of what we're going to get in the second half, looking into these people and were, what kind of people were they? Where did they go? Were they part of the, uh, those 72 that Jesus sent out? Some more of them are. But before we do that, let's have a cheeky to your coffee. He dropped his notes. He's just checking them now. If we start to come back and we'll get... I don't actually know what order he's going to do them in, so we'll... Are you, are you, have you got anything on Phoebe from Ken Korea? Yeah. Uh, although I think I was going to start with okay. Mary, Mark's Mary. mother. Although we'll actually start with Narcissus. Johnny was looking over it and he reckons Narcissus is probably the first one to... So that's in the same verse as Herodian, verse 11. Yes. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Yeah. Go on then, get us into Narcissus. So Narcissus, he's very popular in these lists of the 72. So one of the things that I've done with all these names that you get loads of church historians from very early on. So you've got like Hippolytus right in the second century. So people very early on. Try one of the first things these historians try to do is try to figure out who's in this list of the 72. Because the 12 apostles, uh, they're, they're in the Gospels. Everyone, know, everyone knows exactly who's in those. But you've got this, like, 72, and it's tantalizing. It's like, oh, there's 72 incredibly important people who met the Lord and were super important in the early church. We don't exactly know who all of them were. So, but anyway, so I've looked at loads of those lists, so sometimes I'll mention how many, uh, how, how often they pop up, and Narcissus, he, he pops up a lot. People are pretty certain he's one of these apostles. Um, there's only two I managed to find that don't mention him, and, you know, I looked at dozens. Um, dozens of lists yeah. of apostles. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there were a lot. The, quickly, mm. the, so the name apostle isn't only given to those mm. 12 that, who are mm. like the super apostles. Yeah. Like, all of those 72 that Jesus commissioned, they also have the name Apostle. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, because you get um, Barnabas is quite explicitly called an Apostle, and Junior and Andronicus, we saw yeah, that in yeah. this chapter, they're called Apostles. So what does, the ne- what does Apostle mean? It's like one sent or one appointed. That's it's it. got like, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it's similar to the word like angel, like a messenger, right. but it's like an appointee so as well. So it means a person that mm. Jesus personally appointed yeah. while, during his earthly ministry. So there's yeah. the 12, there's the 72, and there mm. aren't any other apostles after that. Well, Except there is Paul. Paul yeah. gets in, yeah. doesn't he, on a technicality. But he himself yeah. says, look, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know mm. I'm like, oh, yeah. not really legit, yeah, he? Yeah, he, he says does. that I'm the least of the apostles. Because yeah. Jesus does personally appoint him, but via mm. a kind of little appearance like, yeah, like yeah. that. So and he calls Paul, Apollos an apostle, so I guess he okay, sneaks so in. But he, way, he's very cool, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we all agree Apollos, he's, okay. we can understand that one. Just, all right, carry on. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, I've gotten sidetracked there. But yeah, so that's the apostles, and it's very important that there are loads of apostles. Uh, 85, maybe 86 with Apollos as well. Um, lots of apostles. and so. But it's tantalizing to historians. They're like, oh, who's in this group? So who, who's this important? Uh, and most think Narcissus is, and so that's worth mentioning. Uh, and Luke mentions how these Hellenistic Jew- Jewish Christians early on, right after the ascension, they go out and preach to the Greeks. So we see that the, all the apostles preached to like Persians, Ethiopians, everything. There were like loads of people that were re- really eager to welcome in, but they weren't really eager to welcome in the Greeks uh, for various reasons. Um, even Paul wasn't at first. Like it's, the apostles mentioned in Acts, one of the reasons they like him is he, he's quite hard on the, <laughs> the Greeks um, for whatever reason. Um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of historical baggage there. But some of these Christians were very eager and they immediately go to Greeks and they start work there. So when Paul does finally kind of turn around and he's trying to win, win the Greeks over... 
Uh, he's joining an already established mission. That's like, you know, when you read through Acts carefully, some people think of him as the first to go to the Greeks. But he doesn't say that. Acts, you know, Luke in Acts really doesn't say that. Um, there were people who went earlier on. We, we see Philip, you know, immediately he goes preaching to Gentiles. Uh, Narcissus, they say, is one of these that preached very quickly to the Greeks. He kind of sets up this mission that Paul later joins, they say which is quite interesting. And they, they say he went with the, the... Well, there's two Philips. That's quite a confusing thing. There's one of the 12 and one of the 72. They're both like Greeks. They've got Greek names. Um, and Narcissus, it's a very Greek name. It's a name from Greek mythology. It's like... He's so Greek. It's like he was called Plato or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> Narcissus. So he, he was very into the Greek stuff. Uh, anyway, so uh, I've gotten a little side trip there. But he went with Philip of the Twelve to Athens very early, early on. They wanted to go right to the heart of Greek culture. And, you know, I, I always kind of suspected that because it always troubled me how Paul, like, moves on from Athens really quickly. But in his letters, he says, you can't make someone a leader if they've only just converted. And so I was like, so why, why does he move on? Like, immediately, he's like, oh, no. And apparently that's because there was already a church there. So he, he tries to, like, convert a few philosopher kind of people, and then he moves on. And he didn't really intend to say nothing, didn't he? No, He's just, yeah. Um, so that, that's just an interesting thing to note. Narcissus, he was the first bishop of Jeru uh, not Jerusalem, of Athens. Um, and he went there with the apostle Philip of the Twelve. And so he trained up this guy called Hierotheus the Thesmothete. <laughs> very, very cool title there, very unique. Um, who in turn taught Dionysius, the Areopagite. So Paul, he converts this philosopher called Dionysius, and this Hierotheus that Narcissus trained up, trains up Dionysius. So that's so it's in all connected. 17, isn't it? When yeah. Paul does that speech in Athens, and, the, mm. and, and there's a guy called Dionysius mentioned. Yeah. Yes. So he ends up becoming the bishop. So we can see Narcissus and Paul. So Narcissus had kind of laid a few foundations that Paul later built on. And Paul doesn't kind of like doing that, but he did do that in this circumstance. And he is thankful to Narcissus, and he does greet him. Um, and but, well, so there is a lot of history there um, that the Greek Empire. So when we look at the Babylonian Empire, you know, there's those letters that um, Nebuchadnezzar writes, telling everyone to worship the Lord God of Israel. And the Persian Empire, they send letters telling everyone all over the world to worship the Lord God of Israel. Um, but the Greek empires are just really, really horrible to Israel. <laughs> And their philosophies and things, they try and... They already have these preconceived notions of God, which were very difficult to topple and get rid of. So you have these... Like, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dad, Dad knows much more about them than I do. But one of the things about them is they're really... They really want to steer clear of, like, any kind of Greek language or philosophy. They just don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and so they do feel that. They feel slightly concerned that Greeks have such a strong sense of argumentation and philosophy that people get, like, sucked into their philosophy and rhetoric and all of that sort of stuff. And they could lose what was carefully passed on by the prophets and the apostles. Um, and so there was still that kind of fear. And that, that you had Jews who called themselves Hellenistic Jews. You know, it's like... they. Jews, but with like a Greek flavor, and that, that seemed to disturb a lot of Jewish people. It was like, no, no, you, you're just, you're a citizen of Zion, aren't you? You know, and then there's like, oh, but a little bit of Athens, and they're like, no, no, you're not allowed. <laughs> um, it, it was a bit like that. It was like a, a very persuasive culture, and Babylon was sometimes like that. When Daniel felt Babylon's like that, then the language of Babylon is very similar, and then Jews are very much like, oh, you can't have anything to do with Babylon. But in the first century, it was really the Greeks that were that, and Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, no, no. but it's, it's something I care a lot about. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, anyway, so Narcissus, back to Narcissus then. So he's a guy who isn't so bothered with that, and he had gone to Athens. Uh, so Athens is a big city, and that means he's well-established in how to carry out missionary activity in big cities. Um, and St. Mark as well, he, he obviously had that perspective. He ends up going to Alexandria, and both... Narcissus and Mark had a very unique way of carrying out missions where you'd have a bishop, but then they'd have like archpriests and sub-priests. And the reason they did that is you could have little chapel communities, little churches. Because when we see with uh, Paul, and he mentioned when there's many bishops and things, then there's a bit of trouble, many like main kind of leading figures. That wasn't 
that always seems to cause division. But this kind of thing, we have loads of people, they all know who's the bishop in charge, and then they kind of divide up the church into these local church plants, really. That was kind of Narcissus' passion. He, ch- he, he really got loads of church plants in these big cities, and that was what he did. So a lot of early church writers say that this house of Narcissus that Paul refers to isn't his family, like house of, you know, is, is in a lot of the Paul's letters. They say it's actually this, like, a, a little connection, a little, um, you know, um, what would you call it, like a network, a church planting network that he sets up that's like the house of Narcissus. It's his... Uh, like a family of churches then. Yeah, yeah. A family of little churches. But not like a divisive one. They're yeah. very kind of constructive, a big family, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was his kind of one of his main contributions, and that's why he's so helpful to building up churches in big cities. And so the Apostle Mark ends up taking on this strategy to the, this massive African metropolis of Alexandria. Uh, but Narcissus was doing it in Rome, and he set up this like uh, church planting network right in the middle of Rome. And Paul greets not only Narcissus, but all this network. And he's like, because obviously, this is exactly what Paul's talking about. He's loving what they're doing. They really get it, and they're thinking of new ways to be united in Christ and to spread the gospel to more and more people. And this challenge of big cities is, is a really big one, and it's affected loads of people throughout the ages. And this is how he got around it, and he, he got loads done. And Paul really likes that. So he wants to, he's kind of like advertising it a bit. He's bigging up this innovative mission going on. He's giving it a bit of support. Uh, so that's quite cool. And church tradition also says that Herodian was Narcissus' son. But we don't know whether uh, her, uh, Narcissus was the adoptive father or the biological father. Like, that's never cleared up. So w- there's not so much we can infer from Narcissus himself. But yeah, it doesn't matter too much. But it's interesting. Uh, so yeah, that's Narcissus a lot. Else. Yeah. Uh, we'll look at Mary then, yes. Mark's mother. Is that verse, uh, verse 6, I verse think. Six. Uh, yeah, greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Right, so this Mary is usually taken to be John Mark's mother because the book of Acts says that Mark's mother was called Mary. And Peter, in his apostle, says that Mark was with him in Rome. Um, and also, there's an interesting... She's a, a really interesting connection point between lots of different important figures in the New Testament. A lot of them are a part of, like, a big family. And we can figure that out through her... Because if we look back to Acts 12, we see that um, Peter, when he goes back home, he goes to Mary's house. But in the Gospels, you know, Matthew 8, Mark 1, Luke 4, Peter lives with his mother-in-law. So early church tradition says Mary is his mother-in-law. So he married Mark's older sister, Uh, interestingly enough. And then also Barnabas is called Mark's mother's brother, his uncle, um, so, so yeah, <laughs> it does get a little complicated, but it's interesting. Between Mark and Peter? So Peter is Mark's uncle. Yeah. Peter is Mark's uncle. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, yes. Peter married Mark's. No, no, no. It's brother-in-law. brother-in-law. I have gotten it confused. You're right. It didn't need to go over it. Right. right. <laughs> That's my bad. Right. So Peter marries Mark's sister. So Peter ah, is okay. Mark's brother-in-law. Peter marries yes. Mark's sister. <laughs> right, there we go. Um, right, so then Barnabas is Mark's maternal uncle. So he's Mary's brother. Yes. Yes, that does, yes. I've gotten this written down, but it's just not making really sense in my head. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were on Ancestry, so I thought like we, we've really gotten on top of this, but I really haven't. Right. Then they say Aristobulus is Mark's dad. And so he's then, in yes, we, right. yeah. So that's quite cool. So they're all connected, and then yes. So Peter, Mark, Barnabas, and Aristobulus—they're all part of this nuclear family. Church tradition also says that Philo was a cousin of Mark. They don't say and which Philo particular lived cousin. In Alexandria. Yes, he's a, he's a very a important family. early theologian. He he prophesied about Jesus, like in the very decades leading up to Jesus being born. Uh, so he's, a, he's an incredible figure in history. Just how clearly he talks about Jesus before Jesus is Don't born. Is, Philo, yeah, no, but he, he's cool. That he's a relative of Mary. We know like what Mary's household and Aristobulus' household. When he says, "Greet this household," it's an amazing household with great names in it. Yes. Right. So, but Mary, 
before we talk about everyone in her household, Mary herself is called a very helpful worker. She works very hard for the Romans. Um, and there's an incredible fact about her mentioned in Acts that when Peter does go to her house, he's just left waiting outside for ages because Mary reckons that it's just Peter's angel. And she sees angels all the time. She's kind of sick of them. She sees them too much. She's like, oh, it's just another angel. Just tell him to wait. And then Peter's left like, yeah, yeah. He's left out in the rain like, oh, can anyone let me in? <laughs> but she must have been an incredibly pious woman. Um, she's so used to seeing the invisible angels. She's like so accustomed to it. Like the prophet Elisha we see in the Bible. And when Gehazi, and he's all like, oh, no, it's too much, we can't handle it. And Elisha's like, what, what do you mean? Look at all the angels all around us. He's like, there's no angel. And he has, to, you know, he has to open his eyes so he can see that reality. Mary's just like this prophet Elisha um, and could see all the angels all the time, which is an incredible fact. And John Chrysostom is this early Christian writer. He notes that Mary's mentioned ahead of so many others, including many of the apostles and he does that to make sure that the Church of Rome is always appreciative of the work of their women. Uh, he's reminding them what an honor it is to have, uh, they, what an honor they have in that there's so many women among us, but we're put to shame in that we men are left so far behind them. Um, yeah, and Paul also mentions Aristobulus later on, as we mentioned. Uh, but where was he? Because he's mentioned as an ab absentee. It's like, greet his household, not him. Why? Uh, well, according to church tradition, Aristobulus decided to preach to all the Celts, all the Celtic peoples. Uh, he had preached with Andrew and Philip and so on in Galatia. He might have learned Celtic languages there. Although, as a relative of the Herods, the Herods... Because Galatia you know, is Gaulatia, like Gaul, mm. the Celts. So it was, a, it was a colony of the Celtic people that yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we will have learned the kind of Celtic languages there. And then he was able to take that with him to the north of Italy. So the north of Italy at that time was Celtic. Uh, the, in, in fact, he went to Milan with Barnabas, his brother-in-law. Yes, I think. <laughs> it, doesn't it doesn't matter, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. his relative Aristobulus. He calls him a brother, you know, in, in the general sense. Uh, right, so he went to Milan with uh, his relative Barnabas, and Milan was a super important place for the Celts. It was, it's called Mediolanum, and it's one of these things we're, we're very interested in. The, uh, when you look at everywhere the Celts called this name, and no one really knows what it means, but they're all on these like parallels in longitude and latitude and all that, and they, they, when you put them all on a map, they make interesting geometric shapes, and people are like, what does it all mean? And We'll never know, but presumably <laughs> Barnabas and uh, Mark and um, Aristobulus, they all knew because they're like, we've got to go to the Mediolanum places. We've got to like, whatever the Celts are worshipping there, we've got to topple those gods. And, uh, but if you do know, the kind of Victorians tried to figure things out. And so they come up with the ideas of like ley lines and things. Um, I won't get, yeah, I won't. I'm just saying you might know that that's where it kind of comes up and where you might know it from. Um, so Aristobulus, he goes there to Mediolanum, this very important place for the Celts. We don't know why, but he does go there. He goes through Gaul, like what's now France. He goes into Spain. The north of Spain was Celtic at the time. And then he sails over to Britain. He goes to uh, Glastonbury, another very important place for the Celts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has a great time there. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up going to Wales, where he really he decides to stay there. So then his family can join him later on. So they don't join him when he's traveling around, and they, you know, they don't know where, where to go. And then he settles down in Wales, and they can meet up with him there. He's and very important in Welsh church history, isn't he, Aristobulus? He is. He's called Arwistly Hen, which means Aristobulus the Old in Welsh. And there's a cantrev, which is like a sub-shire. Uh, in Wales, that's called Alwistley, and that's where he kind of set up shop and where he, he stayed. And he lived a very long time, into the second century, he lived well over 100 years old, and he preached all the time, and then he ended up being martyred in Wales. And so, yeah, he's a very interesting character. Uh, and so it's very interesting, just that whole family. And then you think, he, there's that family, it's so important, but he only greets a few, because so many are off. They're off preaching in all these places. Uh, so so in, in the case of Aristobulus, his household's there in Rome. 
Mm. But he's out doing the gospel. Yeah. And, and he's going all different cultures and around doing it and ends up in Wales and he's like, does it matter to him that he doesn't know Welsh or things? Yeah. No, I know the gospel, I'm going. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? And yeah. same with Barnabas and Mark, like all that family. So he brings out that family. It's like, as you're saying, like when he's bringing up people to say, look, this is how much the gospel can work. Here's, some, here's a family that really knows it. Every one of them individually have these incredible stories of all the places they went to. And Mark, we mentioned, he went to Alexandria in North Africa. So he was born in North Africa. Aristobulus was born in North Africa as well. That's worth mentioning. Um, they, they were these African Christians who were apostles of the 72. Um, Mark ends up going back to his homeland in Libya, and then he goes Let to Alexandria. Just, state, though, just think of that for a second. Aristobulus, he's mm. born in North Africa. Then he gets a house in Rome, in Europe, then he's going, where's he go? He goes to Italy, France, Spain, and Wales, preaching the gospel. But he's a North African guy doing that. Mm. Just, isn't that absolutely amazing? That is why Paul mentions like that. Because there's a guy who's like, no, I've got the gospel. I can go anywhere. Mm. And he ends up in Wales. And, you know, that is the point. You, you mm. can see why I wanted PJ to sh share these. Because these people... Are, we're supposed to be inspired and go, well, I don't know about going to loads of different countries, but I might go to the house next door and preach the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I guess, well, I suppose they traditionally say he's already in Wales when Paul's writing the letter. So yeah. is that around like 50 or no? So it could be 55, something mm. like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that Britain does have a very early church. And only 100 years later, the high king of the Britons, Arthur's ancestor, Lucius, converts, which is a very cool story. Actually, his dad, Old King Cole, you know, that we know from the song. Very old soul. Yeah, he, was, he wasn't as effective in converting his nation, but he was, you know, he's filled with the joy, uh, peace that passes understanding, all the joy and all of that. You know, and that. hence the, the city of? Colchester, of course. Uh, yeah, that is named after Old King Cole, the first Christian high king of Britain. So Aristobulus did an amazing job planting the church, and he turned that, church, that whole country around very quickly. Whereas like the Roman church, as amazing as it was, you know, it did take 300 years uh, to convert it all. Whereas, you know, Aristobulus, he does a good job, but of course he's kind of from this Roman church and he gets sent out. So, it, you know, it all applies. Um, so, yeah, he's a very interesting character. We've got lots yeah. on Aristobulus. Uh, there's more, but we'll have to move on. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so he mentions a load of uh, An Andrew the Apostle's companions. Oh, yeah. So when all these 72 get sent out, a lot of them kind of stay with one of these 12. And they set up, they kind of, because the 12 divide the world between themselves. They cast lots and they figure out where the Spirit's leading them. So a lot of the 72 decide just to go. Just pause you know, on that yeah. just slightly. Mm. The 12, you know when Jesus ascends and he says to them, right, you need to go into the whole world and preach the gospel to everyone, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them how to obey all that I've commanded and I am with you always going to be. So the, the idea is, as they were there, they're like, right, okay, you know, mm. let's divide up the entire world let's get cracking. I don't know whether they actually did it then, but it's a nice thought. Mm. But they did divide up the world, and off they went, the twelve, to all parts of the world. So yeah. PJ has written, he spent ten years writing a book called The Twelve, mm. and he's researched where did they all go? Because we know, you know, we might say, oh, we know a little bit about Peter, where he went, and John, a little bit because of Acts. But what about the rest of them? So PJ's devoted like at least 10 years to this mm. and uh, researched things all over the world and even translated things that haven't been translated before to find out what happens in the 12. So he's written this book. It'll be coming out soon. You'd mm. be interested. So they, so the 12 do that and then yeah. you're set now. So yeah. on 72. And just as saying that stuff we've translated, we, we often uh, use this um, abbot, Stephen Masters. He's a, a French abbot. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is actually translated from him. So just to give credit where credit's due, and so, so you all know the sources. And if you can read French, um, it, I don't know how to pronounce his name in French, but it is, you know, like Stephen Masters uh, in, French. <laughs> in French. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, yes, so a lot of the, that stuff is his. Uh, it's good stuff. I can read French, but you know. So the 72 basically mm. often tagged along yeah. with some different mm. ones of the 12. Yeah. Right, so Andrew. Yes, so loads of Andrew's friends and companions, in a way, that tagged along with him are mentioned in this list. And we, we see that Paul had a heart for a lot of the people that Andrew ended up preaching to. And he really wanted to preach to the Scythians, the Thracians, and all these, like, northern kind of... What countries would that be today? Uh, so kind of like the European bit of Turkey, um, Romania... Ukraine, Moldavia, uh, Moldova. So Ukraine, you know, in yeah. the news at the moment, we mm. think about that. What, that's a place that Andrew went to and preached yeah. the gospel there very mm. early. Yeah. yeah. And, and is that where the Cimmerians are? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, and we'll get to them in a yeah. second. But uh, yeah, so, but just so you know, yeah, Andrew went all there. And Paul, you know, in, is it in Colossians? And he said he wants to make sure everyone's accepting of the Scythians. Yeah. You know, he, he gives them a threat. And so, and in Acts, he did want to go to preach to the Scythians and the so Thracians. Tell and, us something about the Scythians, though. Yeah. Why is he bothered that they won't be accepted? Well, the, the Romans hated them <laughs> for various reasons. But they were like, they lived a very different kind of life. They were very nomadic. Um, they made copious use of marijuana, which was the main thing <laughs> Romans <laughs> disliked about them. They, they would have like a tent and they'd like have loads of it they'd, and they'd all just enjoy that together. And Romans didn't appreciate that. So they always bring that up with them, which is, a, you know, a bit silly. Uh, but the, the, in the British Museum, they had, they recreated a lot of this stuff, not with the uh, substances but, you know, like kind of models, just so you could see what it was like. And so they, they kind of... get inside a tent and smoke yeah. stuff and get out of their Yeah, heads. so the tent would keep it all in so that it'd get really strong. Um, anyway, so the Romans didn't appreciate that, but Paul's like, none of yeah, your no, business. If he becomes a Christian, <laughs> yeah. you've got to accept someone like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they, but they, and also they do spread a few lies about them. That isn't a lie because they've d dug up that stuff. That is true, but... Right. They, they spread, all, you know, because they just think of them as outside. They're kind of their stereotypical outsider sort of person. Uh, but Paul loves them. Andrew loves them. God loves them. Um, so uh, Paul was always praying for them. And he really wanted to preach to them. But when he tried, the spirit stopped him. He's like, no, they're not for you. Because, so yeah, yeah. What happens is in Acts, he, go, he wants to go to Bithynia. Mm. And he gets turned back. And then he ends up going into Greece, doesn't mm. he? But he was wanting to go to Bithynia. That basically around the Black Sea and all that. Mm. But the Spirit's like, no, nah, not for you. Yeah. Because... Because Andrew is Andrew. much more kind of well-trained for this sort of thing. Like, in the Gospels, when we first meet Andrew, he's off in the wilderness with the prophet John. Um, and so he's like a wild man, isn't An he? Outsider. And like, Yeah, exactly. And they, they, the sort of person Romans don't like. But <laughs> God doesn't care about their opinion. And Andrew's actually really awesome. <laughs> but then Paul... He's, he, he can deal with those philosophers. He wins over those Stoics and things. He, he can deal with, like, kind of language and grammar and things really well. And that didn't interest the Scythians. Uh, and the spirit knew that going in. It's like, that's not their cup of tea. Um, but, you know, yeah, but you, yeah, obviously the spirit really appreciated Paul. And so Paul, though, that, in all this, he's like, oh, don't bully Scythians. So why are we right. mentioning Andrew going up to these people? <laughs> Because Ampliatus had gone and preached to the Scythians with right. Andrew. So, what uh, verse is that person? Ampliatus, right? Yeah, where is it? Uh, there we go. Eight. Greet verse Ampliatus, my dear, dear friend, friend in the Lord. So, he preaches in different places, but they have very similar stories. He preached all throughout the Scythian places and, you know, uh, to the Cimmerians and all of that. Um, and he'd already preached to all those people. By the time, time he came to Rome, and he came to Rome wanting to preach to more countries in the West, having already preached, to, you know. So Paul, he's a, real, he's a real kindred spirit to Paul. And the same people that were always on Paul's heart and that he's always praying for, this guy actually managed to reach them. And so he's really, he, he really likes Ampliatus, and he's his dear friend. Um, yeah, he feels he's his dear friend in the Lord. So there's this other, like, and we'll get to Persis later, but he just calls Persis his, you know, dear friend. It, you know, just personally, they're personally close friends. But he's like, Ampliatus is dear friend in the Lord. Like, he doesn't know him that well necessarily personally. 
but they share a lot of the stories, a lot of the same interests, a lot of the, they care about a lot of the same people. And that means a lot to Paul. And it's really interesting to see that, to see that the, this, the Scythians that the Romans hate, Paul doesn't hate them, Ampliatus doesn't hate them. Ampliatus preached to them, and Paul loves that. Um, just very interesting. Um, and that's interesting, isn't it? Because it's a group of people that Paul was totally ready to go and have a go, but the Lord's yeah. like, no, but personality-wise, I've got <laughs> someone better in mind. And Paul's like, no, I'm totally good. And the Lord's like, yeah, no, you do this. Mm. But Paul, one, that Paul was totally prepared to try and reach people who were way out of his comfort zone, mm. you know, but he, he was prepared to it. And then when he hears about this guy who has done it and gone mm. off to these, like, barbarian outsiders who were out of their heads the whole time, Paul's like, oh, I love that guy. He's done mm. that. He's just gone and converted all those people. Isn't that a lovely little insight? Mm. Yeah. And then Paul does. There's an yeah, interesting yeah. thing Clement mentions. that Because yeah. Clement's in this. Oh, and literally, we... you could only give us something that's three minutes now. Uh, I'll do this quickly because it's like a little point, but it's a great point that we might end on. Clement is mentioned here. I won't tell you Clement's story, but he writes a letter to other churches, uh, like around the turn of the first century. Yeah. Um, and in it, he mentions that there's an, a place far to the west across the ocean that isn't China. He knows there's a place between China and Europe, uh, the Americas, basically. And he says... That, that place, I know, is ordered by the Lord the same as every other place. And then people are like, how do you know that? And then he says, Paul crossed the sea and went to the farthest edges of the West that Paul preached in the Americas, Clement claims. And so, he, so people are like, how do you know what's going on in like places no one's ever been? And he's like, well, Paul went, he, he says, um, so which is a fascinating... The first century, there's this mm. guy called who yeah. writes and just says, yeah, I think, yeah, Paul didn't, went further than Spain. Yeah. yeah. And to, yeah, so if the Romans didn't like the Scythians, you know, like the Native Americans are way out of their, like, cultural and kind of historical framework. And Paul, so in the end, Paul does, so maybe he just wasn't ready for, like, Scythians yet, but he does in the end preach to Native Americans, which is a very interesting fact that Clement mentions. And, yeah. Yeah, way before Christopher Columbus. So then, when, when, you know, sometimes people say, oh, Christopher Columbus was the first guy, uh, first uh, European to, like, discover the Americas, and then sometimes say, oh, no, it's Leif Erikson, like, a bit earlier. And you could be, oh, no, it's the Apostle Paul. We won't do any more, but get, for mm. now, yeah. next week, we'll get more of these, including... You know these Khmerians? Let me just like oh, say that. Yeah. Because the Khmerians are part of these barbarian tribes, aren't they? Yeah. That are kind of in Slavic lands, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, what yeah, we would yeah. call Slavic lands today. And the Khmerians, and it, it, like Conan, isn't it? The sort yeah. Of, yeah, we'll save that for later. But in the list, this is so cool, it's unbelievable. In Romans 16, there's two princesses yeah. isn't that like warrior princesses warrior that, princesses yeah. of the Khmerians and they and do inspire because like Red no, Sonja no, 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 do you know no. I don't know yeah, but Red if you are yeah. Conan fans you might but know we'll Red Sonja we'll do it next yeah. week but literally <laughs> the story of these two mm. Khmerian princesses that, and it's, yeah. they're in they're mentioned in Romans 16 it's such a good story yeah. but literally save it till next week if that doesn't make you come back next week what would <laughs> uh, on, and aren't they amazing yeah, yeah. okay cool. I'll just close in prayer but literally you can't stop Pete it's not like I always stick absolutely to what I'm supposed to talk about but uh, <laughs> I, yeah we may be related you know <laughs> Jonathan all of us are the as bad let me just pray. Heavenly Father, we do love this gospel that you've given to us and that you've made us to be ambassadors. And that it doesn't matter how much ability we have in human power, how skillful we are, or whether we've, we're naturally good at reaching certain kinds. Of, it doesn't matter. Heavenly Father, we know that the gospel is your power. Your power. And that we should have the kind of confidence that these people in Romans 16 had, where they're just like, it doesn't matter who they are, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to tell, I'm going to speak the God spell. And anything can happen when that's said, because it's your power, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much that you have entrusted this message to us and that you will back us up.
if we do it. Heavenly Father, it's exciting that you've given us a life that's such an adventure. And wherever we are, wherever we are, that wonder and miracle can happen if we speak the gospel. Heavenly Father, train us in doing it. Give us confidence. Show us the power of the gospel. Even this week, may we have at least one opportunity to speak the gospel. And Father, encourage us when that happens and show us how to go out like these people did. Please, Father, look after us this week. Train us up in the gospel of Jesus. Give us confidence. Fill us with your spirit. Keep us safe as we travel home. Give us a great night's sleep tonight so that tomorrow we're ready for this new adventure with Jesus on planet Earth. In his name we pray. Amen.